Food is more than just what's on our plate. It's the places where it's grown, it's the people who grow it, and so much more. Join me, Janice Person, your host, on Grounded by the Farm every other week as we talk about the foods we love. For this episode, we're going back to the Delmarva Peninsula. You may remember we started season three on the southern end. We were in Maryland talking to Dana about agritourism. From there, I drove north to Jenny Schmidt's farm. We're going to talk to Jenny about what it's like running a larger operation in that area. She grows a lot of grain, but it's highly diversified. And I love talking to her about all the different crops they've grown over time and how she makes those decisions about what crops to plant, why, how to grow them, all of those things. I had the chance to visit with Jenny in the combine, so that video is going to be on the website, but the audio wasn't great, so we waited to record this episode. So let's go ahead and just get started. Yeah, so we are pretty diversified. Uh, Predominantly, our main crops are corn and soybeans. Um, Those are mostly for poultry feed because Purdue is headquartered here in Maryland. There's quite a number of poultry companies in the area. Uh, Within the soybeans, we still also grow uh, tofu soybeans, so food grade soybeans, which are different um, in nutritional content than um, commodity soybeans. Oh, I love tofu. We also grow vegetables, so we grow some, uh, we grow a couple hundred acres of fresh market green beans that we sell to a distributor on the eastern shore of Virginia. And we uh, have in the past been canning tomato growers for a cannery up in Pennsylvania. And we have 22 acres of wine grapes. I have about five different varieties of wine grapes. And those mostly go to Maryland wineries, although from where my farm is, I can get to Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Virginia, (laughs) or anywhere in Maryland within an hour or two. So I do have a broader base of of options for selling to to the wineries, but we're wholesale. Um, you can't come to our farm and buy anything. Uh, I, when I talk to consumers, I tell them that we're a grocery store farm. We grow ingredients, and that's how that's how I describe our our farm. And in the last year or two, you said nephews have brought a different operation into the farm as well. Yeah. So fifty odd years, my father in law was a hog farmer, and we also had a cow calf operation for uh, ang- uh, Black Angus beef, but um, my husband and brother-in-law, when they took over the farm from their dad, we got out of livestock completely. Um, and then in 2021, with my uh, nephew coming back part-time to the farm, working full-time for a fertilizer company, we uh, got back into hogs, uh, not to, uh, to what we used to do, which is called farrowing, giving birth, raising sows and breeding them to give birth to piglets that you then raise for market. Uh, we have pigs brought in from uh, Pennsylvania. They're at, I don't know, 15 pounds or so, and we grow them out to 280 pounds, which is their market weight. And so that's new. We just um, shipped out our last batch of pigs the first week of January, and our second batch of pigs is arriving tomorrow. So we'll have a round two of, of growing feeder pigs. Um, I love it. I love it. So when I go to the grocery store, I could have some pork chops, some green beans, mm-hmm. <laughs> some tofu, some tomatoes. Yep. and a, None of them will say wine. spit farms on them, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I understand. <laughs> the only thing that actually has our name on it, um, so Hermano Foods in Pennsylvania, uh, we, are, we, we are on their label, their can. So our, the picture of our, our family is um, on their label. They do. That's one of the nice things about some of the com- some of the food companies will feature their growers at various times, yeah. and, and so that is kind of cool when you do get that recognition, and consumers can then actually connect to a real person. Yeah, that's cool. the The farm in Maryland, it's your husband's family. Can you tell me how you ended up, you know, sort of getting there to be a farmer? Sure. Uh, Hans and I, my husband's name is Hans. So we met. Um, after college, we both participated in a 4-H exchange program, an international uh, exchange program. And then after a couple of years, uh, we were dating and I had done my dietetic internship. So my uh, first career is as a registered dietitian. When I moved to Maryland, I worked in a hospital as a registered dietitian. When I got married, I worked as a registered dietitian and started helping out um, on the farm. When the kids came along, I um, 
really didn't want to keep doing hospital dietetics, and I really did enjoy working on the farm. And it was really an advantage for me to have actually a lot of science training in my degrees in nutrition, and uh, just tried to make myself indispensable for being able to drive whatever they needed me to drive. And so that's, I guess, kind of worked my way into a position. Now my husband actually works off the farm now. He took a job at the Maryland Department of Agriculture a little over five years ago. So I've been working full time in his place with my my (laughs) brother-in-law. And it's actually worked out pretty well. He hasn't fired me yet. I love it. I love it. And for a while on the farm, you were basically focused on the wine grapes or? Yeah. So when Hans was home and full time on the farm, I worked, I managed mostly our vineyard. And then I did custom work for other uh, vineyards in the region. So I had an, a part time on farm job and a part time off farm job helping wineries and other folks who wanted to grow grapes get started in the, in the industry. Yeah. And you already mentioned um, the nephews and and the pork. That goes along with the story. I think we were talking with Debbie Lyons Blythe about how to bring in other family members back into the farm when they're younger and sort of getting them to find ways to contribute to the farm and the farm to help support them as well. Right. Because um, there's not necessarily a 40 hour a year round 40 hour plus work week for additional people just randomly. Um, you know, you've, you've got to be able to have the work load for them to justify a salary um, and then, you know, be able to support that person uh, year round. And so right now, even though our farm is, at least for Maryland, fairly large scale, um, we operate with just the two of us, myself and my brother-in-law. And, and in part time, you know, like in in busy season at harvest time, outside of the vineyard, um, you know, my husband pitches in when he can. We have a guy who comes drive trucks for us. But as far as as full-time operators go, it's it's me and my brother-in-law, Alan, and everybody else is kind of on a part-time basis. And you really need to have that workload to justify additional employees, whether they're family or not. Yeah, yeah. And the the payroll and salary and benefits and all that stuff mm-hmm. adds up really fast when you start putting people I don't I don't know of any farm that's just willing to put people on the payroll and not have productive work and yeah, see exactly. the profit. The profit margins aren't there to just start paying people. <laughs> right. And it's just like any other business. I mean, it yes, it's a family operating business, but you, you've got to be able to make those um financially intelligent decisions that don't negatively impact your overall business. Yeah. So what I wanted to talk to you about for the bulk of our conversation today is is something you and I have talked about several times. It's how do you decide what crops to, to put on the farm? You say you used to grow tomatoes or you have grown tomatoes for canning. Let's talk about how your farm navigates all of that kind of stuff. Where do you where do you guys start? So um, we actually sit down about this time of year, every year, and go over what our crop rotation is. Um, we rotate our fields just about every single year. There's rarely a year where we have consecutive identical crops. So we don't do corn on corn year after year. We don't do soybean year after year. We don't, we, every field gets something different the following year. Uh, what we need to juggle is the 700 or so acres that we have that are under irrigation, we need to be able to rotate our vegetables because you cannot get a vegetable contract with any company if you can't guarantee a crop. And you can't guarantee a crop unless you can guarantee water. Um, You can't go through through a drought and not be able to produce uh, vegetables under contract. So we decide how many acres of green beans fit, how many acres of tomatoes fit within that rotation and then look at what the fields had the previous year and whether or not it's going to be corn or soybeans. So if it was soybeans in 2021, it's going to be corn this year. And the only thing that will really change that is where are we going to grow the vegetables and how we're going to rotate that around. Now, even within the vegetables, we have to keep a lot of records on that because you can't grow, go back to vegetables for four years. 
So you need to be able to allocate your acres on a four-year rotation. And that's because <laughs> vegetables are so susceptible to bacterial diseases in the soil that yeah. um, if you do vegetables too many years or even close to being, you know, every other year or something like that, they develop mm-hmm. a lot more disease uh, resistance to disease and then you just don't get a, a healthy crop off of them. So, um, you I know, that, for... that really extends our rotation compared to a lot of other, other farmers who don't have to grow vegetables into the equation. I think for people who garden, that makes absolute sense, right? Like I never put tomatoes in the same place in my garden or in the same container that I did last year or something, I, or I change out the soil or something if I'm using containers. So I think that makes sense. I, I am so confused by the idea of how you rotate all of that and decide how many acres at the same time. So would you be able to put both green beans and tomatoes on a field in that four year period? Or does it does it just have to be out of tomatoes for four years or does it have to be out of vegetables? It has to be out of, so it has to be out of tomatoes for four years and it has to be okay. out of green beans for three. Um, okay. So we, so we just stick with four because it's easier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so green beans can follow tomatoes because they're not related to each other. Um, so yeah, so you could we, have corn, tomatoes, corn, green beans, green beans, right, or something, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand it all, and part of that is the disease pressure, and and usually on corn and soybeans, you're saying you rotate, and that's based on the root structures, the soil health. What all are you looking at on both of rotation? those? Plus the fact that. Um, grain crops are not as disease susceptible as vegetable crops are. Um, they're yeah. also not as, I mean, they're a valuable crop, but it's a different level of, of value. It's more of a commodity as opposed to a specialty crop. Um, and while they, they do develop disease, they're not nearly as susceptible as vegetable crops are. Um, and so that's, that's for us the main, the main difference there. For corn and soybeans, we are looking at, um, you know, the, the fields that they're going into, uh, whether they're irrigated or not, um, is a big deal because soybeans generally can do fairly well in not super dry conditions, but they are more drought tolerant than corn yeah. is, and so we we can't forecast that. <laughs> we do, I think we could, <laughs> um, but if we were to put um, a crop under irrigation, it would more likely be corn than soybeans because corn just needs more water than than soybeans if we need to juggle a, a, a crop around because the field needs a certain rotation and it can't go to yeah. vegetables, it's likely to go to corn because corn is a, a higher value crop as far as irrigated goes. So, Okay, I'm going to ask you some other questions and it, it may not even impact your decisions, but what about the role of like different types of soil? Do you have different soil types under irrigation or it's all your farm sort of similar in soils? Yeah, our, our soils are very similar. There's, you know, some minor differences in terms of how sandy they are or not. So the Delmarva Peninsula is a coastal plain. So we're not farming on beach sand, but we're not farming on heavy clay soils like they are. Or in the Midwest where they've got two feet of topsoil and we have three inches of topsoil. I mean, uh, there's a big yeah. difference in uh, our our organic matter. It's, it's much lower because it's just a much more sandier soil. But our, our as far as those crops go across the board, there's not a lot of difference that the crops need compared to what we have soil-wise. Now we might need to um, build up our organic matter a bit a bit more, which is what we're you know trying to do with no-till and um, you know using mushroom compost and using uh, poultry litter, which has all of the bedding, the sawdust, the straw, Mm -hmm. all of that stuff in it. So it's a fertilizer, but it also helps contribute to the organic matter um, in your soil, which is, you know, a a healthier way of having better soils. Yeah. And organic matter really is like anything you can put back in there that's like 
plant-based or yeah. anything like that. You know, mm -hmm. it's on the, on the video, people will see that you harvest the corn and there's a lot of the corn plant still oh, left wow. in the field. Yeah. That all counts as organic matter yeah. and it kind of gets composted on top of the soil. And exactly. We all know what composting is. So mm -hmm. um, that organic matter really does help us out. All right. So how did you decide perennial crops like grapes? Because once you plant grapes, you got them for a while. Right. Versus doing annual crops like, you know, corn and soybeans and tomatoes and stuff where you plant one year and you harvest that year. Yeah. So back in the late 90s, is when we got out of livestock. And so we were looking at what can we do to add value to the farm without livestock. And corn and soybeans by themselves really were not going to cut it. And um, so we put up, we didn't have any irrigation at the time. We put up some center pivot irrigation and went looking for vegetable contracts. We knew several of our neighbors who were growing vegetables. So we, you know, tapped into their uh, network of vegetables and uh, we're able to get into that. We were also, um, you know, through extension and those types of newsletters, there was uh, some information that went out that Maryland uh, Winery Association was looking for more Maryland grapes because, you know, the whole buy local thing really started a couple <laughs> decades ago, really. Um, and they were looking for more Maryland grapes. And so we attended a couple of meetings and visited a bunch of uh, wineries and vineyards to see is this something that we want to try we took one of our smallest fields which was um, eight acres we took three of those eight acres and put them into grapes uh, to try and uh, try our hand at it and after yeah. a couple of years uh, we were and had a crop because it actually takes three or four years to actually get grapes to produce to begin with so you have a, a heavy upfront investment with a very slow uh, return on that investment before you actually start getting a crop. <laughs> and because we're farmers, and because Maryland is such an urban state, we don't have a land issue as far as being able to add more acres. So uh, when we got reasonably good at growing grapes and people knew that we grew quality grapes and were asking for more grapes, then we started to expand. So now uh, we finished out that uh, eight acre field and then we did another 14 acre field in the front so we have about 22 uh, acres of grapes and the wine industry so, has really grown uh, when we started in the early 2000s it was there was 12 wineries in the state of maryland and now there's over 100 uh, so i don't have a shortage of customers wineries are up everywhere like yeah. anywhere you go in the u.s there's a lot more local wines and and people are learning a lot more about the grapes that grow mm -hmm. well in one region versus another. Right. So not everybody expects the same grapes that they get in Napa anymore, right. which is, yep. is pretty nice. So what would it take if you guys wanted, you know, if, if people came in, they were begging you to grow more grapes, what all would you have to consider? I would assume labor is a big consideration. Labor is my biggest restriction, yeah. Uh, we had a real difficult time this past fall getting enough labor because we hand harvest all of our grapes. And the grapes are our most labor intensive crop and most of the work is done by hand. Um, and so getting enough workers to uh, harvest all those grapes was a real challenge. Um, so that has limited our expansion because I have been asked by several wineries to custom grow more acres of specific varieties that they want more uh, volume of. And we certainly have the land to expand, but it doesn't make sense to expand and then not be able to grow a quality crop because you can't get the labor in to help you get that work, uh, that work done. Um, it's partially resolved, hopefully this coming year, uh, one of the local wineries actually bought a mechanical harvester at the end of the season this year, and they're going to be Nice. Uh, offering custom mechanical harvesting. So for um, our bigger orders, we have a couple of wineries that we ship grapes to by the tractor trailer load. So um, when we're trying to fill a tractor trailer load, you need 15 or 20 odd people, and I just couldn't get that many. Uh, so it's a much slower process to fill a tractor trailer load and get it out on time to the winery. So hopefully 
that will be somewhat resolved this year, and then we can revisit expanding the uh, the vineyard for for more grape production. Yeah, and it kind of sucks that that's like such a one time of year that you need that extra mm-hmm. help. So bringing extra family members and stuff in doesn't really make sense. And I will say this, hiring skilled labor is probably important because I went out and tried to pick grapes for somebody who really needed extra help here. And it was like 100 degrees, so yeah. humid. And I'm just not very good at it. I mean, I, <laughs> I, it, I hated that I... I was dying, <laughs> but it is, it is something that a lot of people would think may be fun. I thought, well, I can be helpful. I'm not, I'm not in the office, so I could go help, but I, I really wasn't very helpful. I know in reality, in of terms work. of especially trying to fill an 18 wheeler full of grapes. It's physically My, demanding and it's hot and it's humid and it's, yeah, and it's tedious. <laughs> People think it's fun. They think they have a glass of wine and they're going to walk around twirling their wine and enjoying their beautiful vineyard, but it's a hell of a lot of work to get it that way. (laughs) Yeah, and do the Lucille Ball thing where they get to stomp grapes. That's what I would really like to do one time. Um, so, So can you tell me, as you guys look at the future now, right now you're not looking to add in more grapes, it sounds like, but are you, are you, looking at different opportunities because of things like climate change and or how how do the opportunities shift for you guys so um we have tried the the seed companies are coming out with some of these uh crops that have drought tolerant traits um that's probably our biggest limitation is um even though we have not quite half of our ground under irrigation. The other half is dependent on Mother Nature for sufficient rain. And while we and had a sandy, good crop, and sandy, sandy soil. soils yep. do not hold yep. water. Yep. That water just goes right down into the water table down deep. Yeah. And typically we get very dry between the 4th of July and sometime in August. And that's the most critical time when corn pollinates and starts to develop you know, the kernels on an ear of corn mm. and whether or not you get enough water is going to dictate how big that ear is and how many kernels it has on it. So looking at mm. the um, the breeding traits that um, companies are looking at to uh, either naturally or scientifically breed in drought tolerant traits, we tried a few of those seed varieties just to, to look at what, if it was, you know, any more advantageous and it's hard to figure out because if you use drought tolerance traits and then you don't have a drought that year, you don't really know <laughs> yeah. if it was beneficial or not. So, you, you know, it's a crap shoot, but that's farming. Um, it's kind of like buying snow shovels, whether you have snow or not, you know, they pay off, right? Right. right. <laughs> um, but, you it. know, for, for us, it's a temperature thing because I, like, I'm looking at putting an irrigation on about a four acre block of my vineyard uh, because this past summer, um, grapes are very drought tolerant. They generally speaking don't need irrigation. Uh, but I had a variety that's not uh, particularly drought tolerant. And the, the heat index plus the dry temperature. Um, it started to defoliate, so the leaves turned brown and they started to just fall off the vine, which is a sign of, of stress uh, on the plant, and that mm-hmm. shortens the life, the, the life expectancy of those plants over the long term. Grapes should live, healthy grape plants should last 30 to 50 or more years in production. Yeah. So, um, so that, I think it's the, the, the extremes that we're seeing in terms of the volume of rain when we get it, not always at the right time, and then <laughs> the extremity of the, the heat index that um, is, I think, probably for us the most noticeable thing. I know other places on the Del Marva they're having, you know, saltwater intrusion because of what's the word I'm looking for? Rising sea levels, you know. But we're yeah. inland. We're inland enough. We're not coastal farmers that we're experiencing anything like that. But other farmers in this region are for sure. Wow. 
I hadn't even thought about that saltwater mm-hmm. intrusion on your fields and mm-hmm. and salt and, and growing plants don't work together, don't go together. that well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nope. it's really tough. Um, you guys are so close to the water, though, the environment and making things work in a way that continues to protect the water and things like that are, mm-hmm. are a big focus on your farm. So how does how does some of that work? in these different crops? Yeah, so um, we have um, we've probably taken out over 120 acres out of production, and we've put that into conservation. We put in uh, grassy buffers so that along ditches and along streams, we have a 50-foot grassy buffer between the field and the stream to you know catch yeah. sediment, catch, catch nutrients. Uh, we have a lot of regulations in the state of Maryland regarding nutrient management. So right now you aren't allowed to apply fertilizer. I see on social media lots of guys in the Midwest are out top dressing wheat right now, putting fertilizer on wheat. And so we can't apply fertilizer until March 1st. I just finished what I submitted yesterday. It was called our AIR, which is our annual implementation report, where we report to the state every single pound of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that we used the previous year. So everything that we did in 2021, I had to compile and submit a report to the state um, because that's that's a mandatory requirement. And that's looking at things like the Chesapeake Bay water and and things like that, right? Yeah, that is pretty complicated, I guess. Can you help me understand the role of the the local market? So let's talk about those tofu soybeans. How does an opportunity like that come up? I said I love soybeans. I love tofu and my nieces and nephews, we we love it. But you obviously don't. But how do you figure out that that's a fit for your farm? I mean, so about 20 odd years ago, Back when this, this actually all relates to nutrient management. This is the funny thing. Um, so about 20 years ago, when nutrient management became regulatory in Maryland, uh, the poultry company started making noise to the government that they might leave the state of Maryland um, if things got over-regulated. And um, a group of farmers in our area got together and decided to look at what could we grow in this region if we don't have the poultry industry. There's no reason for us to ship corn or soybeans to the Midwest. We don't have ethanol plants around here. Uh, We don't have humongous export markets in this area. So you can't all suddenly grow lettuce, and there's not that much of a demand considering. (laughs) But what do you do with the, the equipment that you have? Because you can't just go out and capitalize expensive specialty crop equipment, uh, but right. look at something that you can grow with your existing tractors and your existing harvesting machines for a local market. And so they started, they formulated this farmer's cooperative and they uh, looked into developing this tofu market in the area because there are a number of Asian food processing companies in the DC, Baltimore, Philadelphia, nice. even New York City. I mean, New York City is only three hours from here. So we have really broad access to a humongous market, but you can grow a hell of a lot of soybeans before you need that much for tofu. So it's still actually kind of a limited crop in terms of the number of acres each grower that's in the cooperative, we have to, we all grow a hundred acres of soybean, of tofu soybean. And that's because mm-hmm. the market is isn't that big and you can get yeah. a lot of soybeans off of one acre to make a hell of a lot of tofu. And so it's an opportunity for a diversification, but the market is where we're selling these soybeans by the pallet. They're bagged in 50 pound bags and they go to these uh, food processing companies by the pallet. We're not shipping it, shipping them by the tractor trailer load like we are for poultry feed. Mm-hmm. So it, it is a still a different scale of market. So it doesn't. I mean, it kind of answers the question. And you know, 20 years ago, we still and 20 years later, we still have the poultry industry. Um, but mm-hmm. that's what really drives our markets around here 
is the fact that we have access to the poultry companies that need the feed for their for the chicken industry. A little bit further down on the peninsula on the eastern shore, I met some people at the Extension Service that were looking into various ethnic foods, I guess, you mm-hmm. know, some some peppers that are especially loved uh, in the Caribbean and the Jamaica markets and things like that. So there's always some possibilities, especially based on the population dynamics in your region mm-hmm. of the country. Right. There's there's always something else that probably needs to be grown, but the the issue is is finding the right farms, the people who have the right equipment. Like for right. green beans, do you do you pick all those green beans or? So the reason why we actually got into vegetables, both green beans and canning tomatoes, was because those companies provide the specialty equipment. They provide the harvesters that we don't have. And if we grow 200 acres of green beans and 100 acres of of tomatoes every year, that doesn't cash flow a half million dollar tomato harvester. Like it, it, (laughs) it would make, it would make no sense to buy such an expensive piece of equipment. And so both vegetable companies that we grow for provide the harvesting machine and they provide the trucking. Um, and so they haul their, they haul the, green beans and the tomatoes away in their own trailers with their own truckers and that, you know, we would, again, when we're harvesting tomatoes, we're harvesting 10 or 15 tractor trailer loads a day for about two weeks straight. And so we don't have that many tractors or trailers or drivers. And so that, that really, we can get the plants planted and we can manage the whole growing side of it. But we yeah. would not be able to do the harvesting and the hauling of the of the produce to wherever it's going on our own. Yeah, it's it's funny. I've actually been to a tomato processing plant out in California. They grow a lot of tomatoes mm-hmm. out there. And yeah. everything about it felt different. First off, the smell of tomato harvest was radically, <laughs> radically different than the smell of other harvests. Uh-huh. But to, to see it, I'm going to have to find some photos and things of, of tomato processing mm-hmm. being done because it is, it is truly amazing. But it, it does feel like it's one of those things that, like, you know, you start thinking, well, can we do this? And there's so many different factors that you have to figure right. out. So for you, you're like, well, do we have enough irrigation? How many acres do we have last year? So we do, do we have irrigation? irrigated land that's coming back into the ability to have tomatoes right right? like planting on that four-year basis Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how are you going to get it planted harvested all those kind of things it's um i guess it's why you're really busy in the winter months Mm -hmm. a lot to figure out and plan a lot to figure out and plan for yep yep and the the days aren't necessarily as fun as cutting corn and, and watching those harvest numbers no, it's nowhere near as fun as driving a combine, which is my favorite job. <laughs> uh, I love it. I know the D.C. area got hit hard by snow. This episode's going to be up in the next week. So I think a large part of the U.S. is dealing with snow. Uh-huh. On the farm, what's the biggest problem for you when you get a lot of snow all of a sudden? Oh, getting stuck. <laughs> I mean... Um, <laughs> So, you know, around here in the Mid-Atlantic in Maryland, we're not really used to much volume. And so, you know, a lot of places don't even bother to plow. Uh, uh, they just, because, you know, the, the next day it might be 48 degrees, it will all have melted away. So it would, you kind of get like frozen in place because there's, you know, a period of time where you just can't even really get out. Um, and then the temperature warms up and the snow, you know, disappears. Uh, or like tomorrow, it's supposed to rain. It's supposed to be in the 40s or low 50s and rain. So the the three or four inches that we have on the ground right now will, will disappear tomorrow. Well, those were the questions I had for you. If you oh. um, if you want to find Jenny, she's on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Where all are you at? Those three what places. Do you go by that's, that it, that's my limit. Those three places. I don't do TikTok. <laughs> I don't do YouTube. <laughs> Your farm girl Jen, yep, on on Twitter, Twitter. yep, and the dirt dietitian on Instagram. Don't ask me why I didn't stick with one thing; I just didn't. And the foodie farmer on Facebook. Okay. And Facebook is where I probably am the most active. 
Yeah. It's yeah. Easier to manage. During the year, it's it's easier uh, during the year to share pictures and, mm-hmm. and have more things happening and Instagram. But planning your four year rotation isn't really. Yeah, I mean the kind of the, Instagram fun. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm doing a talk tomorrow at the Mid Atlantic Fruit and Vegetable Convention on advocacy online for your farm, right? And I was like, I haven't really posted anything. <laughs> I've got a very good example. <laughs> Uh, but you know that's what I what I do is I post pictures of what we're doing and right now pictures of um, fertilizer records um, I can post a picture of the vine that I just pruned but you don't want to see that every day um, and that's pretty much every day if it's not raining or snowing I'm in the vineyard pruning so you know you can only post so much right now because there's just not a lot I mean, there's a lot going on but it's just not photographable and postable. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. (laughs) Well, thanks so much. We'll be sure to uh, have everybody see some of the photos and stuff. It it was fun to be in the combine with you. It was. I appreciate you having me. Uh, Watching the video was a lot of fun, too. Uh, We saw a lot of the different animals on your farm. Mm -hmm, That's right. We saw some foxes. Mm -hmm. We saw, gosh, the deer deer were everywhere. And they kept coming back to, like, see us, it felt Mm -hmm. like several raptors that were flying around and everything so it was a lot of fun all right with that we're wrapping up this episode of grounded by the farm you can catch us online and all the places we did think ahead and get grounded by the farm on all the channels so we're a little (laughs) easier on that one than jenny but always check our website groundedbythefarm.com we're putting up more blog posts and stuff now so if you want to get alerted to some of the extra things we're putting on the site there's a subscribe here area on the website easy to find just go ahead and give us your email promise not to overload you finally we just ordered some really cool Grounded by the Farm stickers. So just send us an email, groundedbythefarm at gmail.com. Give us your address and we'll be glad to pop one of those in the mail. So thank you, Jenny, again for being here with us. Always a pleasure to chat with you. You're welcome. Great to be here. Have a great week. <laughs>